I've taken a solo cruise on the Ruby Princess ship before to the Western Caribbean, but this time I was flying into San Francisco to take Ruby Princess north to Alaska. Alaska is one of the most sought after cruise destinations in the world and the prices tend to confirm that. <laughs> but this being my first time to the region, I wasn't really sure what to expect. So in this video, I want to share what surprised me the most about my solo cruise to Alaska, and hopefully it will provide you some tips and first-hand understanding of what it's like to visit this very unique and stunning destination. Of course, if you happen to find value in the information or thoughts I'm bringing you today, I would invite you to consider subscribing to the channel and join our cruise loving community. Number one, the sail away was spectacular. While it is more typical for Alaska cruises to leave out of Seattle, Vancouver, or even a start in Anchorage, might I suggest doing what I did and leave from San Francisco. Not only is summer cool and beautiful in California's Bay Area, but the pier that Princess Cruise Lines leaves from sits in the shadow of places like Union Square and Knob Hill and alongside Fisherman's Wharf. What surprised me was just how picturesque and iconic the entire area surrounding the pier really was, and it made for an aesthetically pleasing location to embark at. It is one of the most spectacular sailaways I have ever experienced, as you not only cruise past Alcatraz Island on your way out to the Pacific Ocean, but you sail right under the grandeur of the Golden Gate Bridge. If you have an option to cruise from San Francisco, I'd say these two factors will help get your cruise off on the right rudder and allow for one of the most memorable sailaways you could ever enjoy. Number two, if you don't have a balcony or ocean view, get one. Something I hadn't considered on an Alaska cruise was just how much there would be to look at all the time while the ship was moving. Truth be told, I'm not a balcony or die type of person. I usually go with whatever is the most cost-effective way to travel, even if that means an interior stateroom, because outside of flat ocean water, there isn't usually much to see between destinations like the Caribbean or Mexico. But this time around, I sprung for a balcony mainly because I knew we would be getting up close and personal to a glacier, as it indicated on our itinerary, and so I knew that would be a really memorable moment that I wanted every opportunity to witness and not have to fight the crowds on the open decks to see when we got close to it. However, what I recognized quickly was just how much there is to see from your balcony at such a constant rate. Pretty much if we were moving outside of the time at sea it took us to get to the region, then there was a ton of natural beauty and wonder to marvel at right outside my sliding glass door. In fact, I slept with the curtains open most nights because it wouldn't get dark until very late, and even then, a beautiful illumination could be seen over the horizon, and it allowed for me to see things throughout the night as I tossed and turned. Whether it was between ports or on the way to the glacier, it was absolutely captivating the entire time. And when we did arrive to Endicott Arm and Dawes Glacier, it was so awe-inspiring as we sailed into and out of the area. Plus, the Ruby Princess does a fantastic 360 slow spin maneuver when it reaches the glacier so everyone can get a perfect view. Again, I say if you're going to Alaska on a ship, make sure you have at minimum an ocean view to get the most out of the experience. Number three, the port stops are mostly walkable. Since I had never been to Alaska by ship before, it never occurred to me that the port stops we would be making would all mostly be right off the downtown areas of these cities. Ketchikan, for example, was literal steps away from a bustling and vibrant little community filled with shops, museums, attractions, restaurants, and a bunch of really walkable historic spaces and gathering spots. 
In fact, the town felt really active, with thousands of ship passengers from multiple vessels all taking to the streets to explore what this laid-back country community had to offer. When we arrived in Juneau, it was much the same thing. The town essentially met the docking area, and you could easily go out on your own and enjoy all of the local businesses, the park areas, and food stops you can handle. Or, before you even get close to those, a row of booths with last-minute excursion options line the route into the town so you can choose what you would most like to do. You could easily set out on your own adventure here and have a great time, or you could book something online ahead of your cruise or at the booths in person for something far more exclusive. The exception to this walkable list would be Sitka, due to the fact that the port itself is about six miles from the city's downtown. However, the city provides complimentary shuttles to and from downtown about every 15 minutes, and you'll be dropped off at Harrigan Centennial Hall, which is a great stepping off point to explore the town of a little more than 8,000 residents. The best way to describe Sitka is like a giant street fair when I visited. I planned no excursions and took a waiting shuttle to the area and walked around for several hours listening to local musicians play. I was admiring the art and history of the community, and yeah, I even partook in some tasty Sitka Eats. Sitka might be best known in pop culture as the backdrop for most of the movie The Proposal, starring Sandra Bullock, Ryan Reynolds, and Betty White, but walking through the streets and taking in the natural beauty and historic heritage of the community was an unexpected treat, and I am glad I chose to just wing it during this stop on the cruise. Number 4. It was a lot warmer than I expected. When it comes to weather in Alaska, what is common weather for one port stop might be radically different at another due to Alaska's vastness and various climates throughout the state. Of course, being Alaska, many people's first thought is that it will be cold and heavy clothing and snow gear should be brought to compensate. But that wasn't what I experienced at all during the majority of the cruise. My cruise was in late August and early September, and most days were in the low to mid 70s, a very comfortable weather for anyone. Even on days where it was overcast or a little drizzly, I was still really comfortable in shorts and a t-shirt. Some folks broke out their ponchos or umbrellas, and that was truly all that was needed. The lone exception to this was the day we cruised up Endicott Arm to Dawes Glacier, and for about 30 minutes leading up to the glacier and away from it was the only time it got cold enough to wear my heavy jacket, my beanie, and put on a pair of pants. At one point, I noticed it had dipped down to the low to mid 40s, but again, it only lasted for about an hour and some change before we were sailing back to warmer and more comfortable conditions. Number five, not all international stops are made the same. Foreign flagged cruise ships sailing from US ports must stop in a foreign port because of the Passenger Services Vessel Act. This is why on a cruise from California to Hawaii, you might stop on one of the days coming back in Ensenada, Mexico, for example. Well, it's the same on an Alaska cruise. However, not all international port stops are made the same as cruising in the Pacific Northwest region of the United States is at a peak level May through September, and with so many ships going the same direction, the more popular international stops like Vancouver, Canada are sometimes already booked, and therefore, a ship might be required to port stop somewhere else entirely. This was the case with my Ruby Princess cruise, as we were heading to a place called Prince Rupert in British Columbia, Canada. The tiny town had a population of 12,000, and it was clear that the area served mainly as an industrial port for supplies. Having never heard of Prince Rupert before and seeing no excursions available via Princess, I hopped off the ship for a little exploring where a small heritage museum, a Tim Hortons, and a Walmart awaited me. 
It was a cultural experience I don't think I'll ever forget. <laughs> Getting aside though, the local vendors who set up along the pier were lovely people, and the town was clean, safe, and comfy. Uh, there was just nothing to do. Something to definitely keep an eye on when it comes to your next Alaska cruise itinerary. Outside of the items on this list, my solo cruise to Alaska was pretty much as I expected it to be, filled with lots of upbeat, happy people who were excited to explore and witness some really incredible aspects of nature. Are you planning on taking a cruise to Alaska solo or otherwise in the near future? Are you prepared to eat more salmon than you've ever eaten in your life? If so, I would love to know when are you going and on which cruise line? Be sure to share that with me in the comments. And to learn about the Ruby Princess ship experience way more in depth, be sure to watch how my Western Caribbean cruise went on this vessel with a full trip report on the right. And we'll see you next time on the Solo Cruiser.